Um, didn't work out, technology's fighting me. Today I've got everything I need to do today done, the plumbing's done, I think I'm gonna try to finish up another harp. I completed a harp earlier this week. It's ready for tempering. Let's get another one ready for tempering. We're in the shop here, we're, let's check out the shop pounds first. Mr. Magoo, Mr. Magoo, what's up, buddy? Well, Mr. Magoo, Miss London, come on over. This ain't a harping show, we're gonna, we're gonna just look at dogs all day, Miss London. German, short hair pointer dog, okay. Now, I got the big camera today. I've got all these, all these frames that I previously had bent and I wonder what type of a harp I'm gonna make here. I got mid-range lengths, I got bass lengths. I can something more along. That length is just a roughly made frame. Let's see, I don't even know where I'm gonna be sticking my heart or my, my phone here. I can find something to put it up against. Bear with me for the live jar belt. If you can see that. Yeah, let's see here. There we go. Oh, it's Joanne. How are you doing? I'm just getting ready to build some harps here. Always be wearing safety glasses. Now, there's not always going to be an ideal place that I can put my phone, so we're just going to do some building. I got some rust on the frame here. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to knock these edges off and give it a little bit of profile because I don't want to just leave it plain ended. I don't like that. So anyways, you're going to be spending today. Uh, watch me grind. Josh Putnam, what's up? I'm just doing a hard build. I'm just going to leave the camera running and we're going we're gonna to be working on some harps. One thing that I really like about in a grinder is a grinder with two sides. You can have your wire wheel, your stone, and also an adjustable speed. Oh, you like this style of frame? I, I do like this style of frame. I got one ready for tempering, one harp uh, frame with a reed in it. It's tuned, engraved, and everything ready for tempering. Tonight, I figured I'm like, ah, I got a little bit of time after I got the plumbing done because. As most of you know, I moved and I've been having tons of plumbing problems. I've been putting the harping on hold. I want to get another harp up and running. So I'm going to get another harp done, hopefully. Uh, not always do harps make the cut. Sometimes they're rejects and I end up selling them for cheap or throwing them away. But um, my plan this afternoon is get another harp with a reed in it, get it tuned up, get it engraved, get it adjusted where it needs to be before tempering, and then do some tempering tonight. So. Bear with me, there's not always a good place to set the iPhone. In the past, I've done a lot of shooting on my expensive high dollar, high definition camera. I've got the iPhone 7. I'm like, oh, I'll just, I'm gonna take advantage, start doing some more live streams and, and whatnot. So anyways, what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be taking this frame and when, I, when I'm making them, normally I adjust them so that they're parallel or near parallel because it makes them easier to sharpen. My next step, um, before sharpening is going to be to do my bevels on my ends. I'll bevel it here and I'll also bevel it in that respect. So this might be a boring video. It might be interesting. I don't know. We're just uh, watching an idiot build a harp. the edge off here um, in this plane. Now I'm going to turn it and we're going to knock the edge off here. I like to do that as well. We're just going to hold it at about oh, a 45 or 50 degree angle. Just enough to give it that little bit of bevel there to thin the profile down 
um, if you find that you're grinding more off one side it's probably because you're pushing pressure up unevenly which is really super easy to do when you're using a angle grinder eventually i'm probably going to be getting a uh, belt grinder or slack belt or something but right now angle or the bench grinder is where it's at Whenever I'm taking off metal, I always go back and forth across the grinding wheel to try to wear my grinding wheel a little bit more evenly because you don't want to be wearing more on one side than the other. See, we have our profile now kind of beveled like a diamond. That's how I, that's how I like them there. Then I've got a little bit of tarnish on it because it's been several months since I built. I also want to knock the burr off here. So I'm going to take the whole thing off the wire wheel and be careful that the wire wheel doesn't grab a hold of your heart. I like the uh, having a little light here, that helps as well too. Okay, got that burr knocked off there. Now I need to go ahead and take the tarnish off. I want to get it polished up nice. In this instance, you got to be careful not to let the, uh, the wire wheel grab and take it from you. taken off the outside I also like to run the wire wheel over these edges as well to kind of make them softer and not so sharp makes it easier to hold and I need to get the tarnish off the inside of here I'll do that by holding the heart parallel and politely pressing down and that'll remove any tarnish on my inside later on we're going to be sharpening it so I like to remove the tarnish before I go sharpening and I'll flip it upside down and lightly pressing it's in these instances holding it like this is when most often the heart will be grabbed and pulled down in uh, hold it up to the light make sure it's polished nicely yeah that's up that's a nice level of uh, polish. Got all the rust and tarnish cleaned off there. Now, next thing that I'm gonna do, and I've got new vices. Uh, haven't yet figured out a name for this. Uh, I'm leaning toward Viceroy. Somebody uh, said uh, Miami Vice might also be a, a nice name for it. I like, I like names that have a good pun to them. It's a beast of a vice. Now, next thing I want to do is I'm going to, we're going to go over to vice versa here. My little vice. All right here. Oh, that's a good angle right there. It's hard to position an iPhone because I ended up lending out my iPhone tripod. I'm going to do a little bit of decoration. Every harp I decorate a little bit different. Sometimes I make small cutouts of here. Sometimes I just do a little bit of engraving. I think I'm going to do a little bit of both. I've got a micro file set that I got from Harbor Freight. Works well for this. Uh, can't ex afford all Grobet files. I do have one Grobet gunsmithing file that I use for undercuts on my uh, on my reeds. Okay, got the harp there. I'm like, mm, let's see. We're gonna give it a around here. The places I try to avoid. <laughs> look at this. This dog was uh, sitting right behind me. Got the loyal dogs guarding me. Um, when we remove metal, if you're going to remove metal for any, any type of uh, decoration, anytime you do that, you're weakening the frame a little bit. So I avoid doing them right on the inside bends uh, or the, on the outside bends or on the inside bends. This straight area here, I can remove small amounts of metal for a decorative effect without harming much of the structural integrity because this, this is 3 16th inch steel. It's pretty tough. Go back and forth. Just give it a look here. 
I'm gonna do a round, and then I've got a half round here. Yeah, I got a round and a half round. We'll go round a half round, and I'll give it a little triangle in between there. Just for a little bit of extra added interest. And we'll give it a triangle here. Just a little bit of extra added interest. I like to have my harps decorated. I think I'm gonna mirror that on the bottom. We're gonna go. Same pattern. decorate your harps. I just like to add some type of interest. I never like leaving a harp plain. That's just my preference. And I'm not removing much metal. If you go filing, I have spent hour or better filing all sorts of really decorative designs, uh, multi-faceted like diamonds. And what ended up happening, as many of the masters predicted before I even tempered it, um, the frame was too weak. Any jaw pressure, any pressure up against your face ended up closing the frame of the heart. So if you're gonna remove metal for decoration, take care where you do it. See, I got kind of, I got metal, the pattern established on top and on this inside. Then I think I'm gonna do another pattern on the other side. It's a little bit different. Oh, we'll go. Oh, do I have a square out? No, I don't have a square one. What do I want to do? I think I'm going to go two in a row here. Similar pattern, but different. Yeah, I want to mirror that. Every harp I'll try to do a little bit different. Somebody said hi. Oh, hello, hi there. It kind of sucked into, uh, into doing my work today. Uh, we're building a harp in the shop. What are y'all up to? Had somebody comment from Hawaii earlier. What I'm doing now is I'm just adding. This doesn't add. This Taking this off the frame isn't going to really change the sound. It just makes it a bit more, more interesting. Sometimes I take an engraver and engrave patterns into them. I think I'm just going to leave it with this sort of this sort of pattern in there. Now I left when I bent this, and that was months ago when I bent, I bent a whole bunch of harps up on my machine. I left these pretty close to parallel, which is gonna make them a lot easier to sharpen. We'll go over that in a second. And if you're if you work a lot with files, you notice that files do get gummed up from the metal. I found it really nice to invest in. This was a present for my wife several years ago. This is a file card, uh, Nicholson makes it. It's got plastic on one side that works really well on your like forward hands. Then on the other side, it's got really super short bristles that work very well at cleaning off files. You give your file a couple strokes, it'll work like new again, whereas a clogged file doesn't work very well and different metals uh, are gonna clog your files up more quickly. And that's, uh, you hear the dogs back there, they're wandering around the shop, not knowing what to do with themselves. And I find it's best to keep your tools, I don't know, pretty much in any trade, because I build sheet metal as well, I work in a shop sometimes. Um, if you're gonna have a shop and you're doing stuff, make sure that you kind of have stations thought out. This is the station where my two vices are, and then I also have all my files and everything that I need to work in this station 
within arm's reach if we look like on the wall. If I want three square file, it's right there, it's put right back. If I want big triangular, it's right there. If I want regular files, it's right there. My four square files, coarse, medium, are right here. I never want to be traveling in the shop. I don't want to walk clear across my shop to grab something that I need because then I'm just wasting time and wasting effort. Um, another thing is have your tools hanging up or have some type of organization for your tools because if you just leave your tools in a pile then you're spending a lot of time just looking for stuff and that, that's not good. It's not going to make for an efficient shop if you're spending large amounts of time looking for stuff. Now, here's the new vice. I think I'm going to call it vice roar unless y'all have a better name for this. Big Wilton vice. Threw down some extra money to buy. Turning her sideways. And the thing I like about this vise is it has two massive lockdowns on it. Whereas my smaller Craftsman vise, which is a good vise, especially for the money, only has the one lockdown. So if you do a lot of torquing and a lot of filing on it, it can move. This giant Wilton really doesn't have that problem. And especially because this base is serrated, there are teeth in there, which allow it so it's not easy for it to move. Which, and a vise, especially I found when you're filing on a harp, for cutting in the reed, you want precise filing. You don't want your, your, your vise to be wiggling back and forth. That throws the precision of your filing off because when you go, and we're gonna be getting into that here pretty soon, when you go to cut your reed in, um, there, there are masters out there from you know Russia and Ukraine who have way better methods than I do. I haven't been building harps that long, but I've noticed you have to be precise when cutting your reed and you don't want to be askew, so make sure your vise is locked down securely. What I found works, let's see if we can find a, Good place to sit this. It's an interesting situation we find ourselves in. Maybe this one. Here. Hold on. Live feed. Anything can happen. Maybe that'll work. Will you work? gonna hold this. There we go. That'll work. That'll work fine right there. What I do for holding my harps and then other masters probably have way more expertise in this. I just took a two by four. I cut myself a 16 inch piece. I cut myself an eight inch piece. The eight inch piece I ran some three inch Torx number nine wood screws in there to hold it perpendicular to it just like an eye that makes for a nice table because when I'm clamping my harps, I want to be able to get clamps on it. I want to be able to move it. And uh, it makes an easy vice table. Now we have our frame here. I'm gonna set it on here. And then I also took a piece of wood. It was from the same two by four. Gongwai says, use the other vice to hold camera if you can swivel it. Hmm. Yeah, I might try that up and coming for when I'm on the other side. I just don't want to put very much pressure on this $800 iPhone. What I did here, and this is from the same 2 by 4 I made my table out of, I took and I filed with a, with a four square file. I got this at Harbor Freight. Not advertising for Harbor Freight. I would invest in much higher quality tools if I had money, but their packs they have for like seven bucks are very reasonable on files. And they've been holding up. I've done a ton of filing on like 1018 mild steel. And I also filed this same groove with it. Had good results with that. But anyways, this isn't so much about a heart building tutorial as it is just, uh, just a little bit of uh, time here in the shop. And that allows me, that groove there allows me so that I can do some filing on my decks because... This 1018, it's square, it's minorly sharp, but I want it sharp. I want a really sharp edge there so that I can get sharp sound. Oh, there it is. Um, after I set up the new shop, I don't know quite where everything's at because I kind of reorganized it. I use these style of clamps here. They're easy to adjust. Now don't put extra pressure on the harp. If you start doing that, you'll start warping your frame in the other dimension, and that's something that you don't want to do. I'm just using a coarse four square file, got it at Harbor Freight. You'll probably see me doing this several times. This is the file card I was talking about that cleans it. 
I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use it to sharpen. I'm filing along there and I'm mildly turning it in there because I don't wanna take a ton of metal off my deck. I just want to get it sharp. when the light catches it when it starts to get sharp, especially when you pull your harp out and look at it from a different angle. You don't want to see any flat spots. <coughs> Same as you would with sharpening an axe blade, getting your rough edge, your edge profile down. got there with my cable clamp in my new vise it takes a little bit of adjustment because it's it's much taller here we have see the light catching it we're starting to get it sharp there but I don't want to go all the way until I meet the other side because that changes where the alignment of my center point of my decks is so I'm gonna go till I don't <coughs> anyways I'm gonna go till I can see that it's shiny all along the edges where I sharpen, then I'm gonna flip it over and do the same thing again. That thing I like keeping near broom and a dustpan. The metal shit is off. And normally, when I'm doing this, when I'm not doing a live feed, I'm wearing um, either a respirator or a dust mask because it's not good to be breathing in, especially if you're gonna be making lots of harps, doing lots of grinding, lots of filing. It's not good to be breathing in iron dust but for the sake of the live feed <coughs> I'm gonna be breathing in a little bit of iron dust so I'm gonna do the same thing on the other side and I'm not if we look at the profile of our decks where they meet I'm not holding it exactly perpendicular I'm turning in just a little bit to the frame so that I'm not taking off large amounts of metal I'm just doing sharpening Okay, both of our edges have met, and you can tell that when your two edges meet, you can see a burr, and I like to hold it up to the light because you can see where that burr is, and it starts to roll over. That means that you filed all the way to the edge and you're creating that burr. And I've got the burr most of the way down here in the center where my roller contacted when I bent the harp. It's, it's not quite, I'm not getting a burr yet. Same thing happens when you're, when you're sharpening an axe or something with a file before you put it to the stone. You'll start to see that burr get created. And you know you filed all the way to the edge up. Alternative way to do that 
Some people also will take, um, when they sharpen axes, I would go from sharpening axes to sharpening these. You can also take a permanent marker, mark all the way to the edge. When your permanent marker is gone, then you know that you file all the way to the edge and it's time to flip it over. I just go to uh, the burr method. And if you have a well-lit shop, you can actually see that burr. take and take a couple strokes of the file each way, flip it over, do the same thing again. We're taking that burr and we're breaking it off there. And every time I take that burr off there, I'm going to use a little bit of less pressure to make a smoother edge. Yeah, the light will tell you so much about your edge. Here at the end of the find it's easier just to hold it by hand. I'm not putting that much pressure on, I'm not removing that much metal. Now we're done with our rough or coarse four square file. I'm going over to like a more medium of a four square file. I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna take a couple strokes, turning into it, and I'm gonna flip it. Using lighter and lighter pressure every time I flip it. I don't want to do file for long, long amounts of time. I did that in the past. What I notice is that you start making your, your gap wider and wider as you remove more and more metal. That's about all the metal I want to take. I can see that my edges have met and I've got a fine burr on there. Move the trash can closer. And what I, where I go from there, yeah. I got a course. Uh, this is a cylinder bore hone. I actually got this for free. A company that makes cylinder bores or compressors. Is that what it is? It's square, just like my decks are. So I put a little bit of water on there. Take a couple strokes. So just going finer and finer. And I'll do the same thing. This is a very, very fine, fine grid of cylinder bore hone. I'll put a little bit of water on there. Take a couple strokes. Turn it over. We're just polishing that edge and we're polishing that burr back off there. Because I want it to be a, a fine edge. I don't want it to be a toothy edge. Toothy edges, when you look at them like under a microscope, it look hairy and that makes for a hairy, fuzzy sound. Now if you look at it, under a powerful enough microscope or powerful enough magnifying glass, you're gonna see that it still has a fine burr on it. Just the finer the burr, the better to a certain extent. You don't have to go a super high level of polish, but you don't want a rough edge. Yeah, it's polished out nicely. I'm not keeping everything near where I need to be, do I? There we are. Trying to acclimate to the new shop. Now we got a decent level of polish on the inside of our decks. Now, we're gonna do, so I got a caliper here. I'm gonna check the reading. I can already tell that this is way, way too big. I never want to read that wide on a harp that's this, that's this long. Because it's just not gonna flex well. It's just gonna to be too stiff. The wider my read is, the more stiffness that it's gonna to impart to it. At the back, yeah, we're seven millimeters apart. I wanna get down, get down into three. So let's adjust our vise. I haven't even used my uh, brass jaws I had made for this. Had a machine shop make me some some vice jaws here, and they're they're milled out for different sizes of stock, which I found helpful. Not a necessity, but it has been helpful in, a, in what I'm going to do here. Just a moment. Should be locked in correctly. There it is. 
I'm gonna set it in the place that I have milled out from a stock. I'm still too wide at the back. Yeah, I'm still in the sixes. We're gonna adjust our outside bends before we adjust our inside bends back out. This giant wood block has got to go. Now, the way I adjust my heart back out is I just use a pair of pliers and a piece of leather. Probably a way better way to do it. But I don't know exactly how other makers do it. Maybe someday I'll have to take a trip over to Russia and see how, what their techniques are. Well, we're getting... We're getting better. We need to go back out with our outside bend. Just clamping it here to hold it. Spreading the back apart a little bit. It's kind of, you kind of got to eyeball, see where things are at. If you start making harps, you're going to learn very quickly that there's a lot of adjustment in, in making harps. I spend as much time adjusting things when they get finished as about anything else. I got my inside adjusted enough, I need to kick my outside back out. And I'm gonna go back to wearing my safety glasses. I'm not setting a very good example. I'm an advocate for safety glasses, especially when you're grinding. Okay, we're getting closer. We need to come back out a little bit more. Closer there, I think I still need to come out a little bit, maybe in a little bit. I found what works for me is three something to about two something. At the end, we're 2.61. We're 4.3. So if I wanted to make a 20 harp, that's how I would do it. I'm gonna bring my inside in by squeezing this a little tighter. Spread it back out up top. Hmm. We're a little bit too close to the tips, but I can I know that my base is getting pretty close. Yeah, we're at 3.89, so my base is correct. I just need the frame come back out. I can look, I can see which one's off. This one is kicked in a little bit too much. It can, it can be the one that comes out. Still a little bit. That's too thin at the end. Unless I wanted to make a really twangy harp, where yeah, we're at 2.04. I want to come. I want to be in the, in the 2.6s or so. And your taper, your length, your width, all that is going to affect everything. So as you build harps, you're going to have to experiment around and see what works. I know what works for the thickness and the type of spring steel that I use. to learn as a as a maker in my free time. I adjust things and adjust them back and adjust them again. Like, oh, 
like this. Yeah, we're back at 3.9. We're gonna go in just a tad. Now I know I'm dang close. So I'm just gonna go in a little bit. Another thing we don't want, we don't want too much taper and we don't want too little taper because too much taper is going to give us a weird sound. Too little taper, if they're parallel, it, it makes the reed unstable. I'm talking, didn't even look at my numbers. I do that a lot too. I'll check my phone for the time. Won't even look at the time. Come on in just a hair. I don't do these adjustments before I sharpen my deck because I find that when you have more taper on your, on your arms, like the correct taper that I need, it makes it hard to file them. A little bit more. Ooh. 3.4. I went a little bit too far again. Getting notifications on my phone there. Come on, just a little bit. I would love to go to Russia someday and see how those masters make, because they they make harps all the time. And they probably have much, much better, more efficient techniques than I do because I really didn't have anybody who taught me how to do this. Two point three six. Well now I'm gonna go just a little bit more and then we're gonna call it call it good. The one I made earlier this week is bassy and saturated. This might just be a twangier one. One thing to remember, there we go. We're at 2.36, 3.67. That's gonna be a twangier harp. What was I saying? Ah, I forgot it. Now, through all that adjustment, the ends of my frames are just a little bit off. I'm gonna take a buzz it. Let's go over to the grinder. And just buzz it off and then re-grind it to match. <laughs> a little bit on harps. I like to make harps that play really, really fast. So here at the end where my knee bend or elbow is going to be, I like to take a three square file. This is a Nicholson. This file handle actually has an interesting story to it. This was uh, Grandpa Bev's file handle. I like to repurpose, you know, tools, especially if they're old family tools. And this file handle fits any file. It's pretty, pretty cool file handle, I'm going to take it and I'm going to take and I'm just going to cut like a little V notch in, a little relief for my for my knee bend because I noticed that reeds flex the most irregularly at the knee bend because that's where the most flexing is. At back here in the in the deck area where it makes most of the sound, that's not that's not where the irregular flexing occurs. It's right here at the knee bend. So where the where the uh, frame comes around it, I like to make a little relief cut. So any sort, if you get violent playing a harp, it has a little bit more leeway because it really doesn't create any, any or much sound out there. So I figure it's a very small sacrifice to make for a harp that can be played a lot more aggressively. And you don't lose much back pressure at all. I like to sight down it, make sure my reliefs are cut the same. That you notice if you work with files while doing fine filing is it's really easy to apply some twist as you're as you're filing and then you're you're filing crooked. So take a couple strokes. I like to take a couple strokes and look, make sure it's even. 
All right, I, I don't do much of a relief cut there. Just, it's about like that. Now I'll take it to the wire wheel and just buzz it. Careful not to push it too far onto there because the rest of my deck is really sharp. I don't want to be dulling that with the wire wheel. That's why I do all my cleanup on my frames before then because I don't want to be buffing, polishing, taking a wire wheel and dulling this aspect of my deck. Now we're ready to cut out a reed. And get a sip of water. I, I didn't even realize we've been on here 38 minutes. Lies, 40 minutes and 31 seconds. Half of it's been talking. Okay, we'll see if there's a good way to set this up here so you can see what I'm doing. Not a tripod. Somebody said clamp in the vise. I'm gonna clamp an $800 iPhone in a vise. Let's see if it works. Thing about this machine, this vice it opens up very, very wide. There we go. Turn it. This vice does have solid lockdowns, but they're a lot harder to break free than some of the other vices. Oh, there we go. Who was it? Gong wise chimed in said for me to do that. Gong wise, you were right. Thank you, you just learned me something about clamping phones and vices. Now here I've got a piece of my spring steel. One thing I've noticed about the spring steel I use, it comes in a sheet like this was, was it originally eight inches by 10 feet? Well, the factory edge is kind of rolled and irregular. So first thing I did is I sheared off part of it in my shear so I know that this edge is real good and straight. And what I like to do, we have these here, zero one. I'm gonna mark near the ends, but where the last part of the frame is, before my relief cut, I'm gonna put a mark there. Helps to have a sharp pencil, I got a mark there. Then before my outward bends, last part of the straight part, I'm gonna put a mark there. Now if I'm measuring it, I need it to be an even measurement. Here we have four, I'm gonna go three, three and a half centimeters or 35 millimeters. I found, I live in the US where we use standard measuring, but I found for fine measurements like this, you can't beat the metric system. You can't beat a system of measurement that comes in tens. Now I have, in between my two marks, I have 35 millimeters in between them. Good measurement there. Now, my my triggers, I always make them to uh, 25 millimeters, but I want a little waste. I don't want it tapered down to nothing. So I'm gonna come in, we're gonna come in, oh, more than that. We're gonna come in 40 millimeters, I'm gonna put a mark. Now that mark is going to line up with the mark I put on here before my relief. So I know that I'm going to be coming another 35 millimeters on there. So the distance in between my two marks is the same on my harp as it is on my metal. So first thing I'm going to do here, throw this out, then I'm going to take a measurement in between my frame and careful not to apply much pressure because you can spread your frame apart. I want to be able to just barely slide it in and out. 2.33 millimeters. That's a little bit harsher of a taper than I normally go, but we're going to make a twangy harp. My harps are going to kind of vary. This is going to change the tuning as well. And I'll show you how to tune them up there at the end there. Got a mark on there. This is just a scratch all used for sheet metal. Um, this is Malco A1. Comes with a nice, nice point. Um, you don't want a cheaper scratch all that doesn't have a fine point. Because I want this fine point. I want to be able to make a mark exactly where I want. We'll take our calipers. We'll take our second reading. Here, see there? It doesn't slide in and out easily. I know I'm putting too much pressure, so I'm spreading the frame apart. A little bit more, a little bit less. There we go. Right there, 3.57. My taper in 35 millimeters is 3.57 millimeters to, what was it, 2.2 something, which is a little bit more 
drastic of a taper than I normally do, but let's see how it sounds. I'm predicting this is gonna make it sound twanging, country sounding. Put the mark there. There we go. Now, that lines up with our marks there. So our taper of this reed that I'm going to cut is going to perfectly match or close to perfectly match the frame. When I first started building, I ran into huge, huge problems adjusting frames and adjusting this and adjusting that because I didn't think it through. I just cut what I thought a reed should be and then I made what I could make for a frame and then I tried to make the two match. I found it works better if you have a reed that's going to match your harp a lot better. Now this is gonna change a little bit as well when we grind it off, when we do our honing. So it's actually gonna sit in a little bit different of a spot because we change this just a tab, depending on how much you ground, ground off. And I know this taper is gonna match that because I can see this mark, I can see this mark, went straight across. This is just a cheap stainless steel ruler. Helps to have a nice ruler. You don't wanna be on something on a regular surface like wood or whatever, or something that's gonna be warped. So make sure you have a good ruler. I think I picked this one up again. It, Harbor Freight it has millimeters on one side, inches on the other. Way easier to use the millimeters. And I, mean, I, I come from a country where we don't use millimeters, but when you're laying out harps, I would highly suggest doing it in millimeters. We're going to, for ease of use here, we're just gonna clamp this back on the vise. I'm gonna take, the, take it over to my shear here is a darker area of the shop where I need to see the shininess of my line that I scratched in there. So what I do is I just have a little, little lantern that helps me. And the shear I use is a Diacro 24 inch. I got it second hand. It was still expensive, but Diacro makes very, very fine stuff. They're here in uh, Minnesota. And it has a good clamping edge too. I found it may move a little bit. So I put my hand down on it and do a quick shear. If you do a slow shear, I've noticed, if you shear too slowly, and, oh, I almost perfectly matched the line I drew on there. If you shear too slowly, the tendency is, is the shear will move it more than if you do a fast shear. So just get it adjusted, get it held good, make sure your, your hold down is adjusted well. One good shear, bam, done. Now. Man, this vice tripod that Gong Wise told me about it, Gong Wise, you knew what you was talking about. And I may be eating my words before the end of the day if I have to buy a new phone. Okay. What are we doing? Doing, um, I can still see my marks on there, my in and out point. Let's just check and see how that, oh yeah, that, that matches that perfectly tight as well. So I know I don't need to do any grinding or sharpening past the end of here. So I'm gonna mark just barely past there. And I'm gonna mark it with a permanent marker. I got my permanent marker, I ain't got stuff where I need it. I'm gonna mark that, because I know that I don't have to do any sharpening past there. Here's my point that I need. Actually, I could, I could just do just sharpening up to my deck, but I sharpen all the way back and plus a little bit past there, so I've got a little bit of extra leeway. I can go a little bit deeper if I want. If after I start mounting my reed in there and driving this into place and my frame spread apart a little bit more and I decide, oh, I need to drive it in more, I've got more of that is sharpened, but you do not have to sharpen it. Now, normally I have a glove where I have the tip of the finger cut off so that I can slide the reed along there. I don't have that on me at the moment, and I'm just gonna hold my finger along there. Be careful, because you will cut yourself. I'm gonna move fast enough. It's getting warm, but it's not getting hot. Now I can hold it up to the light. I can see where it's catching the light. I can also see the flat edge. I'm gonna take a couple strokes off this. The key to getting a uh, good even edge is your technique when you pull. I'm holding and I'm drawing across so it's the same exact angle and I'm taking off the same amount. So I'm gonna go what it looks like about halfway. And then I'm gonna repeat on the other side. Yeah, I wish I had that glove, that tip of that glove finger for doing that. It makes it so much easier. Now holding it up to the light, if 
I have light catching on there, I can see areas where it's still flat. So I know that my two edges haven't quite matched up yet. So I'm just gonna repeat until they do. And I'm using lighter pressure now because I'm getting closer to the edge. Almost. Now normally for grinding I wear a respirator because you don't want to be building it, you don't want to be breathing in all that iron dust. But for the sake of talking today, I'm breaking my own safety rules and not wearing a PPE. Okay, that's come all the way to the center. Consistent drawing across will give you good results. You can also feel it wants it to be smooth. like it's been ground by a machine and also when we look at it just straight on I don't want to see any light glinting that means there's flat parts um, and we're going until we have a very mild burr on there and I found do all the work you can on the grinder and that'll leave you with less work to go when it comes time to hone which the time to hone it be now say Magoo Magoo Magoo's just wait let's move over to here Oh, orientation is locked. There we go. Yeah, can't. Once we go into live mode, we can't flip the orientation of the foam. Or it don't like it. Let's see if we can do this here. Our handy dandy vice tripod. Okay, that'll do. Next thing, this is a uh, Norton uh, India Stone. I think it's medium fine. I use it for, for honing because we've, we've done all the metal removal that we want. Now we need to hone that burr off there. Just take a little bit of water, put it on there, and finally hone it. People have told me, well, why don't you just why don't you do all your metal removal by hand with a file or on a stone? Well, that takes a lot of time. I found that using the, using the grinder to remove the metal and get your edge profile right, it's 10 times faster. And then your final honing is easy. And it's easy once you get really good in practice at this. 
especially on the grinder, to do perfect edges. It, I mean, my edge, here there's no wavering in it. It looks like an edge done by a machine, you know, at a knife shop. That's all in the drawing across. I was putting it up against, at the angle I wanted, up against my, my bench grinder and drawing it across smooth and at a, at a good rate of speed. So I'm getting smooth and even removal. We're just honing that burr off there and polishing this edge. Just like our decks, we don't want our sound to be furry. And I can feel, as I take my fingers down past there, I can feel that it feels smooth. You don't want to feel any roughness. We're going to get our edge profiles all smooth and polished up. And the next thing I want to do here is because this is sharp. This is, this is, if I took this and put pressure down and ran it across my finger, it'd cut me. If this hit your tongue while you're playing, this would cut you. It'd split your tongue open. I want to have, let me see if I can get down here. I want to have the sharp profile, but I don't want to have the sharp edge because I don't want somebody who's performing a tongue slap technique, it cut their tongue. So I want the sharp profile, which profile would be the two edges meeting. I just don't want the razor sharp edge on there. And you definitely do not want to leave any type of burr on your reed because what will cut you worse than a sharp reed is a burr because a burr is like a little saw blade. What I've found to work, this is a Another piece of two by four, this is gonna be used to push our, our frame together. I'll take and I'll go one, two, and this is actually, I'm like working it like I'm cutting in to the wood, one, two, one, two, that's gonna break the burr off, and then I'm going to polish it on the wood. This is actually a version of stropping, and as I'm polishing one side, I'm bringing it up and sawing a little bit with it perpendicular because I don't want this to be sharp. I don't want any burrs. This is another good way to strop your axes. I seen uh, there was an old man who had a video on YouTube of axe sharpening. He used to work for the forestry service. He would do his grinding, his filing, and then he would finally strop on wood. Now for knives, razor blades, a lot of people strop on, uh, on leather. I find it works just as well to strop, well, almost as well to strop on wood. Cardboard works surprisingly well on your knives as well for stropping. Because all stropping is, we're not removing any metal, we're just breaking fine burrs off there. Okay, now this is very, it has a sharp profile, but it's not, it's not razor sharp. I can run my fingers along there without really cutting myself. That's what I want. Now, let's go ahead and set our other, oh, this orientation lock. Oh yeah, there we go. We're almost an hour into this. I guess it's just gonna be a full heart build. Well, not full, I, did, I didn't show bending my frames, but if you look at Let's Make a Jaw Harp, the 19 part series, it has all that in there, shot from different angles. Oh, this, this one isn't wide enough to do that. Maybe we can catch it that way, in that dimension. My other, my craftsman device isn't, isn't wide enough to hold camera. So, just set up, just giving it a quarter turn, then we can put our table back in there. And it's about time for a drink of water, all this talking, making me dry out. And I'm, I have no problem showing the techniques I use on my harp. Everything except for my, my tempering, my heat treating part right now, it, it helps with the finish, helps it uh, remain cor corrosion free and it also changes the Rockwell hardness of my reeds a little bit and closes my gaps That's why I go a little bit loose with my gaps because after heat treat after they cool all night The frames, you know, we heat them up. They expand a little bit then they contract a little bit more than They've expanded and they'll tighten down on themselves. That's why I don't go horribly horribly tight um, because after my heat treat, it's going to tighten up. I have no problem showing all the techniques I use. And I really didn't learn these uh, from anyone. I did watch some YouTube videos. And then a guy from Vibe Forge, Andre, uh, gave me some advice. Especially uh, Russians are real good at about telling you uh, what you're doing wrong. And I do like the, uh, the way Russians talk. Because if you're doing something wrong, a Russian won't beat around the bush. Like a lot of us Americans, if somebody's doing something that we perceive as stupid, where it will be like, oh, well, you know, this, that, the other. Um, maybe try this this way, uh, and it'll be better. The Russians, when they see you doing something that doesn't work very well, will be like, that doesn't work, or yeah, no, not that. <laughs> I like the, uh, the direct approach. 
I don't know if that's um, just the way that they that they always are, or if that's a translation thing. But I, I do like that. I like it when people are are direct. I'm clamping. This is the base we've seen in the past. Eight inch two by four perpendicular to a sixteen inch two by four. So it gives us eight inches of working base here. Clamp the device. It's a table. Then it turns back into a vise. Now, where are we at here? We have we have our frame. I wonder if there's a way I could set this up over here. Oh wait. Mm. Oh, if I could make that work, that'd be a good angle. But I don't think that'll work. I don't think it'll stay. I'll move some files. Maybe that'll give us a good angle. Hello, Miss London. There we go. That's not that's not as bad there. I don't know if you'll be able to quite see what I'm about to do, but if you want to know more in depth about this process, go ahead and check out my uh, YouTube video, Let's Make a Jaw Harp. It's a 19 part series. I've got, I use the big camera and the big mic and get it from all different angles so you can see this. Yeah, that ain't gonna work there. I'm gonna have to get my other, my other one back. Mm. Yeah, we're just gonna stick it with that. And what I'm gonna be doing as you're not gonna be able to see it real well, I'm going to cut a groove in here with the file. And then after that, I'm gonna use my Grobit or Grobe gunsmithing file. The best uh, three square file I've found so far, much better than the Harbor Freight ones. And undercut it. What we're gonna do is I use a Sharpie and I've got my marks where this should be, but they kind of washed off because of the water. I can actually just read the measurement. He was at four. And I'll hold it where it lines up perfectly, and then I'll make marks on the, the butt end of my frame. Where should go? Yeah, I want to hold it dead straight. And I don't want to be cutting in things askew. And this will tell me where I go from, you know just removing stock to where I need to be. So I'll know when I start getting close. When I start getting close to my lines, I know then I have to start pounding in the reed and checking it. And there's the marks there where that should be straight. And there's the end of it. Kind of smeared that around a bit. I'm gonna take my other little, hello Miss London. Pretty girl. That's the uh, that's a dog. If you want to check out Miss London, I'm just gonna clamp this into place. Miss London, where you be going? Oh, Miss London. We got two dogs and a cat and a baby seem to be on the way. Baby, my wife's due in January, but baby could, it, it could come anytime. It's gonna be a gonna be a big baby, I guess. Uh, the doctors predict if she goes full term, it's gonna be like a over a nine pound baby. So. Good, I'm gonna take this file. Oh, come on. It's hardest to get started, so I take little teeny swaths here. And if you notice that you're a little bit off. It's for me. I always put more pressure on the left hand side. So a lot of times I got to sight down it. Okay, when I'm coming off square, I'm gonna cut until I have. Yeah, a little. See that right there? I got a little wall that's gonna hold me. And I used to do this all with the file, but I found if yeah, you're careful, now it is super easy to mess up and overcut this and then have to do a whole bunch of correction or just throw the harp away. Use a Dremel, 
and a little cutting blade. Use a grinding blade as well. I find it's nice to be able to hear people. So I wear hearing protection. I'm gonna go and do a lot of this removal with the machine for time's sake. I keep it on a lower speed so I'm not taking too much off. I don't have as much precision with the Dremel. Just using it to remove the bolt. Take a little bit off, look at it. All right, let's take a look and see what we got here. Okay, I've did a lot. Let me see if we can get it in front of that. I've did a lot of the, uh, the removal, the rough removal, with the tool. Now I'm gonna go back to my file, square everything back up here. Don't put too much pressure on here, because anytime you're clamping it, it's gonna bend it a little bit. I'm gonna have to recorrect that later. off look because you don't I've so many times I've gone too far and then you end up and your reads askew it's a skew on this plane it's a skew this plane because you just took too much off take a little bit off and look because you've got so much work in this heart <coughs> into bending it getting everything ready we don't want to fail this is the area here where I fail have failed and will fail in the future the most often make sure we're not taking too much off the front off the back all of that everything and heart building affects everything. So it's it's really, really important in this respect that we get things correct. Okay, I'm still correct. We look, now we have a much, much nicer channel there. It's even, but I didn't go all the way to the center because now I'm going to begin, be, I'm going to begin undercutting it this way and undercutting it that way with the three square file. Take the file card, make sure it's clean. Take off a little bit, check it, take off a little bit, check it, because I have gone, I've gone too far too many times. Uh, way too many harps, and I still do from time to time. Have harps that just don't play well because they're, I could never get them to line back up properly because my reed was cut in way uneven. And it may happen again, it may happen on this video. I, I fail often. Um, I've got, I've made lots of harps now. My earlier harps really didn't play that well. Even, even in the summer, they didn't, they didn't play, they played okay, but they didn't play where I wanted to. Now I'm getting to the point where semi-consistently I get harps to come out well. Here it's in the fine, fine details. The alignment, because we're aligning on several different planes. We're aligning it on this plane. We're aligning it front to back. We're aligning it side to side. There are one, two, three, about four, three to four planes that you need to worry about. And you need to be checking, you need to be siding down. Once I get a little bit closer here, I'm going to pound my reed into place. Because what I want is I want my reed to slide in like it's a puzzle piece. Then I'll make relief cuts and I'll bend my undercuts over. So we're gonna slide in, see where we're at. Yeah, we're not, we're coming in straight but we're not, we're not to where we need to be yet. We need to just keep removing metal. And I have, after I crimp my read in, I have tons of adjustment to do. I haven't, I have not, I have yet to figure out a method that doesn't have a lot of adjustment to it. And I think that'll just come in time and years to come I'll get better in that respect. Because I've only been building since last January, and not even full time. I I do heating and air HVAC work for a living, 
So this is a part-time thing. Once the baby arrives, it's gonna be a part-part-time thing. I got a very long queue of people waiting for my harps and I just get the harps when I can. There's a lot of work goes into a harp. I don't make I don't make as much on a harp when I sell it as I would at my job, you know, at, at, especially at overtime rate, you know. I could stay, I could stay, oh, an hour and a half extra at work and make more than I do on a harp, but I'll have, and I figure all the time I have, especially in my finishing and tempering, I got a lot more time in a harp than that. I would love someday to take a trip over to Russia or Ukraine and learn from one of the greats the ways they do it, because these are, a lot of these methods of the way I'm doing this are ways I just came to by trial and error. I didn't have a teacher that I could go study under, so I would love to do that someday. That would be, that would be great. File a little bit, look a little bit. I think that I find it's nice, and these come in the Harbor Freight package. They have the, the files that aren't a three square file, but they're a triangular file and they're smooth on two sides, but they're rough on the bottom so that you don't take any, if you need to take some off your bottom without removing any off your sides, you can. But yeah, for undercutting, the best file I've found so far, Grobet or Grobe gunsmithing file. Because if you're gonna do gunsmithing as well, you need a, you need a very precise file. Bob it worked very well. A lot of them old gunsmiths. And I enjoy watching those videos though. The old gunsmiths, they'll take and they'll have spring steel or they'll have steel and they'll manufacture their own parts with files and a vise, much like we're doing here. Okay, I'm getting close. So I'm gonna take my hammer. And these hammers are actually, these are body working hammers. These were Grandpa Bev's as well. I like having tools that, that tie us to the past. We're getting close here. Take a look. See where I got in this respect here? I'm doing pretty good. But in the respect I'm not doing good is look at it on this plane. I'm about far enough in back, but I need to take more off of the front because my reed is pitching uphill. I don't want it to pitch uphill. I want it to, I'm gonna stop right before I'm sitting even with the frames and I'm gonna have to do some adjustment, I'll just tell you that. One thing I've learned, when you're trying to get your reed out, don't grab a hold of it and pull like this. It's a good way if you're, even though this reed is not is no longer sharp, there's not a burr on it, if I grab a hold of it and pull as, fast, as hard as I can, it puts a lot of pressure as it slides past, then that's a good way to get cut. I've, I've been cut very well by reeds in the past. I'll clamp it back in, give it a little wiggle, take it back out. Now I know that I have to take off, put away some files here, that I have to take a little bit off the back. I'm coming in about correct, so I'll, I'll put that pressure there on the back to remove. Look at it, test fit it, look at it, test fit it. Now we're getting close here. Oh wait, <laughs> I don't want to take off the back. See, that's that's another thing I've done in the past. I've looked at it, I'm like, okay, I need to take metal off here. I end up taking metal off incorrectly. If my reed is pitching uphill, I don't want to take off the back. I want to take off of the front. So I'm gonna put a little bit of extra pressure on the front, just a little bit. I'm not removing much off the sides. I want to slide in a little bit deeper, but I want also want to correct how my reed slides in. Now, once you start getting close, you've got to check and you've got to check often to see if it fits. It's too easy to go too far. We'll slide this in. Well, oh, that's better. Give it a couple taps. But before I crimp it, I want it like, like a puzzle piece. Okay, we're sitting about where we want in center, but if we look at it, it's pitching off to this side too much. So I can apply a little bit of extra pressure and see if I can turn that 
Get that read to turn. If not, it means I need to correct my channel. Oh yeah, here it goes. Put the pressure here. Yeah, I'm still touching. Here, that means that it's a little bit's got to come off. So I'm going to need to take a little bit off the back side, a little bit off the front side in that respect to bring that back out straight. Just a little bit. I'm so close now. I mean, we're dealing with not even millimeters. We're dealing with uh, fractions, just very, very small adjustments I make here. And if I'm off, which I probably will be once I crimp it, by the time my reeds will turn just a little bit. So I'm gonna have to make that up with my frame. That is, that's livable and I, I think it's gonna turn even more than that. That's livable right there because I know that when I make my crimp, my frame's gonna spread out a little bit too and sometimes my reed will turn to the left. And I'm gonna have to, that's gonna have to come back out in the adjustment. I think that'll work. Now I'm gonna make my relief cuts. My frame, where I cut it out, overhangs a little bit. Now I need to make a relief cut here so I don't have to beat the, beat the heck out of this because the more I beat on this frame, the more it's going to deform it. <coughs> also need to take a little bit more off the front because I'm still, even now, I'm pitching upward just a tad. So I'm gonna correct that before I do my relief cuts. Wife who's carrying my awesome child. I'm not on camera. No, you're on, you're on YouTube though. Your beautiful voices. She's an amazing lady. I'm lucky to have her. Now, what I'm going to do here is this is a three square file. You can find it at your local hardware store. This is a Nicholson. I can afford a couple Nicholson files. Right next to my read, I'm going to make a little groove. if you can see that see them little grooves right next to my channel those are going to be the beginnings of my relief cut and since I'm lazy I'm going to go ahead and use the Dremel on low speed on low speed because I don't want to go too far.
Okay, we got our relief cuts in place, and this is gonna make it way, way easier. See them there? The two cuts I made next to there? Way easier to crimp that so that we're just crimping over some little ears besides warping the whole frame around it. Now, I've done a lot of vibration here, so I'm gonna make sure that we're still drove in because I want the tension of it fitting like a puzzle piece to help hold it as well as the crimp. I never want to cut a bigger channel than what I need and then just rely on the pressure of the crimp. I want the sides and everything closed around it because those things will rob you of your sound. They'll cause reeds to come loose. They'll cause premature rattling. Um, when you're playing a harp and you hear a ping, like for me, I hear a ping in my left ear, like down near my jaw. That's, the, that's a loose crimp, just barely rattling. Now we know we're in there good. This is the way I do this here. Got these, what would they be called, a punch? I don't want to go all at once. I don't want my reed to come clear off to the side. Now, even as I'm doing this, I notice my reed is pitching up. This is where I fail the most often as well. And this, in the future, I'm gonna figure out better ways to do it. Well, there you go. My reed, it's moving off to the side. It's, it's coming down on this plane better, but it's, yeah, it's, move, it's pitching off to the side. Just like I've had happen so many times in the past, I have not fit, uh, figured out an excellent way to combat that yet. That's something I uh, need to do some learning. Now I still got a little gaps near the sides. I need to, <coughs> or I like to, use just a little bit of hammer in there to close them. I don't want any phantom rings, anything robbing me of the sound I could get. Yeah, we're almost closed there. And all this, the, the unadjusting that my crimping did, that's going to have to come back out. And that's something I'm going to have to do some research in the future. Like, there's, there's not any reference for these techniques that I've found. So it's stuff that I have to figure it out for myself. Sometimes it's worse than others. I know my channel is good, so I think it's just the frame itself deforming. Yeah, we're sitting almost good there. Good on front. too hard I try to go a little bit at a time because I don't want anytime I beat on the frame I know that I'm deforming it a little bit and I don't want that as I've been hammering it down it straightened out a little bit Kind of deforming evenly. Oh, I got just a tiny gap on the right hand side. Come on, buddy. Heart making, at least for me, it's not a fast process. I think much more production can be done if you make flat framed harps with screwed reeds because that would just make the adjustment so, so much easier. Don't have to worry about spring back on metal, how much is deforming. 
but making a harp like that isn't really an option. Like a Glaserin style harp for us in our small shops. All those harps are laser cut. And I think the milled out as well. And I do, I do really like Glaserin harps, especially the Batman, the Alpha, fantastic. Almost, just a little bit more. We're gonna be there. I do have the arbor press behind me, but I use the arbor press more for straightening warp frames and warp arms than anything. Okay, we're there. We're a uh, little microscopic gap. I don't want any type of, of gaps. I don't want any rings, none of that. I, I hate playing a harp that has a ring. It's not even necessarily the reed that's loose, it's the back of the reed vibrating and moving tiny amounts. Oh yeah, that's entirely appropriate. There we are. Now we're closed on both sides with no gap. Now what I do is I cut this off with a pair of tin snips, wherever my snips have gone off to. There we go. They didn't get put back where they were supposed to. I'm gonna cut this tail off. I don't like leaving tails on the end of my harp. I'm gonna get a sip of water. Take it over to the grinder. Grind this tail off, take this to the wire wheel, get rid of the roughness of my crab. Um. See that? Get you up in here in the light here. That is closed 100% around there. No chance for rattling, no chance for phantom vibrations. And I took this to the wire wheel. There's our crimp there. Get you up in the light. There's our crimp there. It looks nice, smooth. Um, on the back side of this, I'll get a little bit of roughness just from, just from beating on it, from being up against our railroad tie. So I'll take that to the wire wheel as well. I, I don't like my harps to have roughness. I want them to be smooth to the touch. I don't necessarily polish them as many as a lot of makers do. I just want them to feel. Want the heart when you hold it to 
feel smooth on your hands. Now we're pretty decent in this respect. We'll have to do some adjustment there. In this respect, it moved on me. So, we're gonna have to take care of that. And I haven't found a good remedy for not having this occur yet. I spent lots and lots of time adjusting harps. Get them correctly, because being flat on every plane is really, really influences the sound more than you would even think. Put files away. So easy for a shop to quickly get out. Okay, here's where the, the vice is the probably one of the vice and files are probably one of the most important tools I've got. Okay. I'm gonna have to be chasing that side. I'm gonna take you out. I'm gonna be adjusting it on all planes here. Yes. This is quite the, we're, day, we're an hour and a half. Lucky I have my charger out here. There we go, few out. I've got my two by four, I use a two by four to help me adjust. Oh, well, that's not too bad. If you look at this respect, my gaps are getting decently even. Let me go back out. You got a dog sleeping over there? Yeah, goose snoring. That's just the tip out. Hold on, there's going to be a lot of adjustment here. Tip of that one to go. You're gonna hear me grunting and groaning adjusting this. Yeah, that's gotta go out. Come on now, hold back out to me. A little bounce now. Yeah, that's better. Now, we're getting pretty decent in this respect. Still, my reed is heading off yonder. I need to take my frame and follow it. That's the, in that plane, that's what, you can have tight gaps, but that's what gives you your fuzziness. You don't want fuzziness. Oop, too far. Closer. Sometimes it's hard to see. Yeah, 
Especially with that window shining sunshine over. Oh, we're getting close there. I want it to be flat. This one isn't quite flat with it. I can see it by sighting down it. Closer to correct. That needs to go in. Now we're good on that plane. I need to bring, do some adjustment at the base, which that's one of the more difficult areas to adjust in the past I've found. Bring it in and bring my bends back out. Like that. Just go too far. This is probably the more boring part of the video. We'll watch a guy make adjustments on a vice all day long. Easy. I go too far, too often. We're getting there. Come on, don't go too far. on that side. And the height at which you clamp it allows you to adjust it in different spots. Come on now, Harp, just for me. I'm gonna have to eventually make myself some hard rubber jaws. Even the steel slips a little bit. I got the brass jaws. Haven't yet got the chance to try them. Yeah, we're too close on that side. Adjuster, we're gonna pop over this other vise. You're not gonna be able to see me here for a second. We'll get a better grip. Difficult adjustment to make here. It's going to have to be. 
to be made. Out with the frame. Just a tip. Earlier, I went in too far, and my bases got too close together. Oop. Right through my leather. That will always be a clicker if I don't if I don't get rid of that. the bases but I have the hardest time getting adjusted properly. That base is just too close for my liking. If I don't fix it now it's going to be hard to fix later. Where are we? We're at, oh, we're at a hundred and some minutes. somewhere. Use the block to push. Okay. Now we're good. We can get the get rid of the sun here. We're better adjusted in this respect. I can hold it straight. I'm still off a little bit in this plane. All that adjusted, adjusted me out of plane again. But it's not much. The sun shining in this window is a new deal for me to have to contend with. Gonna have to get some curtains put up there eventually. There we go. A little bit.
think that's pretty dang close. Okay, we're gonna move on to our next part. I like, man, that sunshine, that sun setting there is bright. I like my trigger total length be about 25 millimeters on market. Then I'm gonna cut it off with the 10 snips. Make sure this sharp little needle sharp tail doesn't go flying. I don't want one of my awesome dogs to step on it. And I also, I don't like to leave this flat, so I bring them to a point on the angle grinder. Keep it on a slower speed so I can maintain a little bit of extra control. Brought it to a nice little point. Everything's still smooth on my frame. All right, now I got to a nice point here, and oh, it's slightly irregular. I don't want. I don't want no irregularities. don't want my point to be irregular. Everything, I've learned on the jaw harp, everything affects everything. So I try to get things as consistent, even as possible. Now we remember our cylinder bore hubs. I want to smooth the sides of my trigger off, especially where I ground it to a point. I don't want any burr on there. I want my trigger to be drag free when your finger goes down it. I, d I want it to be polished smooth. I don't want any burr. I don't want any drag. Because that not only does that create noise, it also creates drag and throws off the way the trigger throws. Notice if you ever have a harp with a rough trigger on it, it it'll clink more sometimes. And you get the, the sound of your finger dragging across it. So I want it to be nice and smooth. Went over it with the coarse, now I'm going with the really fine, and I'm just gonna polish that smooth. Not only that, about eighth inch to a quarter inch into the frame where my relief cutoff is, where my knee bend, where my trigger elbow is gonna be, I'm also going to use the fine on that as well. I want to make that area, and I do that, by, I'll just take a gander here. I do that by, as I pass the stone over there, I move it outside of my trigger so that I can get down there and smooth that. Because sometimes that area contacts the inside of your lip, depending on your heart position, and I don't want to be cutting people's lips. I've, I've ordered hearts before, and they do that. Like, if, especially if you get where there's not a recess and it's sharp there, it'll make like a little scissor and it'll draw blood on the, on the inside of your lip. I don't like that, so. I like my harps to not be uncomfortable, not to do things like that. I'm just gonna do a little bit extra time polishing up. I'm using water on our cylinder bore hounds. And if you have a place in town, like a machine shop that makes compressors or stuff like that, manufacturing facility, they may have these because once they get worn to a certain percentage, because a cylinder bore has to be perfect, they just throw them away or give them away. Now, next part we're gonna do here, and I'm gonna grab a couple different types of pliers. I've got, here it is, we're gonna turn this so we can see a little bit better. Actually, we're gonna move over to this one. Hopefully we'll not have the sun shining so bright. I'm just gonna use the anvil on the back of my vise, I got a little, at first when I started building, I bought an expensive Dremel uh, torch that had different attachments. It didn't hold up over time, wasn't necessary. This is just a cheap butane torch. 
I have a pair of old pliers that I got for free. I took and on my, on my grinder, I ground all the teeth off them and then I polished them smooth with the wire wheel and then actually took a stone to them. So it's very smooth and it's a pair of pliers. You got a couple different pairs of uh, needle nose I use. These are Black Hawk needle nose. This is some assorted off brand that comes to a very fine tip. And then I also have, Andre from Vibe Forge turned me on to these as well, loop making pliers for like jewelry. If we look at the end of them, it's half cup there. It really is nice for making triggers, makes it so much easier. Then I have water for a quench, because I don't want to anneal it. I'm, I'm technically annealing the spring steel a little bit, taking the springiness out of it to bend it by heating it up, and then I quench it back in the water to restore it to a harder, more, more springy state. So where I have my uh, relief cup, let me get a sip of water, I'm, this is a long video. Normally I'd have music playing in the shop here, uh, but for copyright purposes, I don't have any music playing. I'm gonna take my marker and I'm gonna make a little mark right where I want my knee bend. I don't really want it to be much outside of my decks, but I also don't want it to be inside. So I'm just gonna put a mark right about where my reliefs are. <laughs> Here's another place that I've failed often as well, and you might, come on now. You might see it today as well. I have spent, you know, hours building a harp and then got in a hurry adjusting or bending a reed and snapped the reed off at the elbow. And I hope that doesn't happen today. It doesn't happen often anymore, but it does happen from time to time. So we need to take care when making our bend. Let the heat do our work for us, but don't get it too hot. Now I'm gripping it with my smooth jaw pliers right on the other side of my mark. And then I'm going to grip it Now I want to make sure I'm gripping it semi-perpendicular so that when I bend it, it's not clear off to the side, but sometimes that does happen. And I'm going to grip it with my needle nose with a small space. But the heat's only applying or concentrating on where I want this bend. And you can kind of feel the metal begin to let go. Careful not to break it. I've broken many before and it is, it is heartbreaking. Okay, I gave it a quench. I went almost all the way. I want it to sit at 90 degrees or slightly recurved in. So I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna grip it again with my smooth jaw plier. And then I'm also going to grip it this time with a smaller needle nose I've found really helps because I don't want a massive knee bend. Just light pressure, let the heat do its thing. You can actually feel it begin to release. Okay, I'm slightly recurved in. I'll probably go a little bit back out. I'm almost perpendicular. I'm gonna bring it back this way as well. I can actually bring it out just by gripping it with the pliers. I'll put just a little bit of pressure. The pliers are hot. Not quite, you see I'm I'm off to the side, I don't want that. I want it to be perpendicular in both respects. And just light pressure. Toss away, I'm losing hairs off my hand. I'm not quite perpendicular yet, so I'm gonna continue to make my adjustment. And I don't wanna to put too much pressure on because I'm bending it cold. Where are we at there? Oh, I'm almost. It's times like this, I don't want to get in a hurry. I don't want to snap the end off of here. It's heartbreaking when you do that. There we go, I'm about perpendicular. Here, I'm just slightly recurved down. Now I'm going to make my, make my loop. I'm gonna grip it again with my smooth jaw pliers. Ow. Fire is hot, lesson of the day. Now I have my loop making pliers. These are cheap. They're probably eight to $12 loop making pliers for jewelry making. And think about which way you're making your loop. I want to make it this way. So I'm going to heat up. 
And I don't want to force it because I've broken plenty of triggers off this way as well. Gripping, re-gripping, working the metal. Do my quench, get that little Now I've went most of the way there. I'm probably going to do just a little bit more before I bring it back in. I like to recurve it back in because I don't want a place for your finger to hang up. There we go, I'm almost touching there. I'll heat up just that area. There we go. That's about what I like right there. I'll shut you off. Go over the grinder. That about where am I here? There we go. That's about what I like there. I'm going to change it just a little bit. I'm going to buzz just the corner of that so that I get a little bit. I don't have drag, but my finger can catch on it just a little bit for outward stroking or outward plucking. I'm going to take on a really low speed. And just buzz just the inside of that, just to hit, just to blend it in. All right. Oh, this video is about over because I don't show my tempering technique. Where am I at here? There we go. Right there. That, or sometimes a little bit more teardrop shaped, is about what I like. I like it to be at a 90 degree angle. It's not too bad. Now the next aspect I'm not going to be able to show you because my tuner is on my iPhone, but I'm gonna play it. In front, and my gaps aren't tight yet. My gap tightening up and readjustment's going to come after my tempering, after my finish, because my gaps are going to close as well. I don't have bad sound at all here. Um, but to tune, what I'm gonna do is I have a tuner app that I bought on my iPhone. You can get them for free, but I don't like downloading apps for free because a lot of the times they invade your phone, steal your privacy. I'm going to play it open tone right in front of my tuner, and it's gonna tell me it, what note I'm nearest and if I'm sharp or flat and then I'm going to raise my tone to my nearest My nearest note the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to remove just a small small amount of metal And that's going to raise my tone up and that's how I'm going to tune it But I'm going to probably wrap this video up because I'm going to have to close out of this to get into my tuner app Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed uh, watching me um, Ramble a, ramble a bit and uh, make a harp and this harp's going to be joining the other harp I'm gonna be tuning it up and then tonight I'm going to be tempering it and tomorrow morning I'm gonna be making my final adjustments closing my gaps if needs be if there's any plain issues I'll take care of them as well um, Also when I'm tuning I might adjust this trigger inward and slightly Recurve it out. I find that it's best uh, to play the harp a little bit, see what you think it needs. If, if the trigger isn't contacting your finger where you think it should be, then you can adjust inward or outward just a little bit. Just what I've learned is don't go over 90, don't come out here because then the trigger, it causes extraneous overtones and it also 